we just jump in into the section number one, the non-human section? Let's... So that's that means you want to go non-human, is that right? We want to go non-human. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. So Barbara, do you know about um eyebrow eyebrow lice? Uh no. They're like tiny and they live in the eyebrows of most people. During the day, they hide in like in the hair follicles. But with a good microscope, you can see the little antennas sticking out. But at night, they come out and like walk over your face where they eat and meet and have sex before they retreat back into your eyebrows again to sleep and attend to their offspring. So very close to and on and all around the human eye, you know, this metaphor instrument of human vision live other beings. Well, I think that speaks so well to the fact that we are not individuals. I mean, I didn't know about eyebrow lice, but I love this story. And we're really walking collaborations between different entities. Yeah, and these terms like non-human, I guess they all like try to come to terms with the fact that we never really have been human in the first place, you know, that we are kind of deeply interconnected with other than human life forms and with non-living matters, machines, and infrastructures, as well as biochemical processes. And all of this is shaping us and, and the planet, really. Yeah, I think um, that gave us kind of a first idea of what this first section will be all about. Um, we will start now with uh, a movement lecture by Alexandra Piric, which is exploring future ground. Um, and her video lecture, oh, wow, that's nice. Not the other direction, there you go, no. There. Anyway, get it. <laughs> and uh, after her video lecture, we will have our first live panel discussion. So a quick reminder again, I will join the first Q&A of the panel discussion to pass questions from our Telegram group to the panelists. So do join the Telegram group if you want to join the discussion. Do ask questions throughout the panel. We'll do our best to keep an eye out for your input and more words. No, no, go ahead. I'm uh... okay. Don't mind me. Yeah. Okay, never mind more words. We will do our best to keep an eye out for your input and we present you in the session. So, Moritz, could you take us to uh, future ground? Poetry is part of any revolution. An estrangement from things as usual. Instead of being exhausted by the metaphor of the blizzard, as futurists loved to imagine. Conjunctures that make change graspable and possible are matters of sustained efforts and complete transformations of subjectivity. It is these that build trade unions, cooperatives, institutions for and of a different culture. And new education practices. Then what grows out of the different seeds planted by these conjunctures is that which is best nurtured and allowed to grow. Alongside dreams of industrial development, fire and speed, we might remember Isadora Duncan opening a dance school in Moscow in 1921. 
which attempted to feed its students from its own collectively grown garden. Progress and evolution are still being articulated through language and visual metaphors by excessive use of straight lines of words like up, forward, fast, the erectile upwards explosion of rockets and skyscrapers. If only form wouldn't align with function for this masculinist dream of speed, verticality and combustion as pleasure. When we know that pleasure is in fact a matter of sensibility and attention to each other and to rhythm. According to the dictionary, downshifting means living a simpler life. Oh, the lost arts of attention, the excitement and complexity of living the life of a financial advisor. And how does slowing down sound in the world where speed and growth have intrinsically positive connotations. Green sustainable businesses still have to remain competitive. Stock market graphs showing downward moving lines are the most feared. The economy is going to hell instead of going to heaven. What should we do with spirals though? Where moving backwards is actually moving forward. Let's say we do not need to slow down. We need to take time. To demand time and take it 
if not receive. To refuse not to have it. There's pleasure in taking time. Some climbing plants move up to three inches per day. As philosopher of science Paco Calvo says, that is a lot. Three inches is a lot. It just depends what you want to do. How should we spend our time once we are nourished? Or why shouldn't we even enjoy today spending time growing and appreciating that which nourishes us? Walking through the forest requires that one pays attention to multiple things in multiple directions. You can't just look ahead. The topography always changes even subtly. You need to watch, feel where you put your step. There's no flat ground. Movement here cannot be standardized or automated. The road is not cleared for smooth locomotion and transportation. Looking up, feeling up, moving up. Combines with looking, feeling, moving down, around, up close, further away. Planetary sounds like a most important word, courageously grappling with the scale of the problems today. Why bother with anything less, under, lower down? Why pay attention to a multiplicity of scales, as Anand Singh invites us to do? Maybe because there is no such thing as a standard, single one. Combining words is maybe not the best solution for language, but for a start, uttering these connected sounds might help relation. Thinking things together rather than again cramming them into overarching concepts and categories that might describe more of one's own sense of importance than the reality of the world. And what exactly is important and for whom? I'd like to learn to think move like in a forest. one that has not been industrially planted and has no large open path cut through it. An environment that is not easily predictable, in which we can still train to observe and move. 
as humans, as human animals. And with the help of multi-sensory integration afforded by embodiment, which is not the same with processing different streams of data, which is not the same with interpreting abstract information while always seated in an ergonomic chair in front of a screen. Different movement is different knowledge and different becoming. Always moving in straight lines on flat land is thinking becoming the same way. Even here in Domogled, where Romanian authorities make the least effort to regulate anything, forest rangers tell you not to go off path. You might get lost, get bitten by vipers, and you also disturb local flora. Your steps, the pressure your body applies on the ground, the sounds it makes, they can all erode soil, destroy ecosystems. With how much care and attention then should we step in the world so that we are still able to respond to and grapple with the non-designed effects of our actions? How do we become other than the human bull in the world china shop? At what scales should we think about our steps? If you pay attention to plant life when walking through the forest, your walking changes. You spend more time walking. You spend time and take time to move alongside everything that moves, thinks, feels around you. A different speed and at different scales. But pleasure is a matter of sensitivity to each other and to rhythm. What the camera sees is not what I feel. Recording is always partial, as any experience. And happiness, a meaningful moment, is always also about an excess. Something that is impossible to contain and translate. like trying to capture a beautiful sunset on camera. You trade off the fleeting feeling of wonder for the kitsch postcard promise of permanence.
Not everything needs to be captured or exteriorized into an artifact or onto a different support. At least not before most of us actually manage to gather some knowledge to exteriorize. And what kind of knowledge? Define in which way? And gathered with which sensibility should we exteriorize today into our tools and technology? And for what purpose? And how do we define what is human or humane so we know what we want to survive? The forest here surrounds a thermal bath resort now almost in ruin. I was reminded of this place by a video game, one that I actually used to play when I was a child. It was called Siberia. The character was a young American lady playing a detective that at some point would travel to a ruined seaside resort to solve a quest. The place was called Aralbad. I didn't get the reference then because I had no knowledge of the Aral Sea at that time or the ecological disaster brought about by the large geoengineering project that made it dry up. Because of pollution, the characters would wear face masks in the decaying comfort of Aralbad. They're reminded of us today. Dreams of control are hidden frustrations. Collaboration and humility are our best approaches and chances. Even as we desperately acknowledge, we might never learn how to do that, to step in like in the forest. Poetry is not a rejection of reason, but it's sophistication and expansion. Below the forest, large great buildings lay decrepit in the forgotten spa resort. Some are from former imperial times, when the Habsburgs came to spend time caring for themselves and marking their names on the walls of thermal spring caves. Others from communist times when the Hercules brutalist complex was supposed to host and offer leisure time to thousands of workers right near the old imperial bath. Then came laissez-faire capitalist transition and left them all to rot. Too big to be salvaged, administrated, or repurposed by community initiatives. And which community? Too unimportant because of their location and old body technologies for new power. The only large thing thriving amongst these ruins is an old sequoia tree.
Hello, everyone. <laughs> Good to be here in front of the ZKM uh, Kubo. Um, I welcome you, everyone, um, you behind the screens, following and participating since last night, and my dear panelists here. Um, I want to welcome you to the first panel discussion um, of the Driving the Human Conference Festival. Um, my name is Lina Reitschuster, and I have the honor moderating the panel on the non-human. And therefore, it is my duty to remind you once again of our good, nice, and good, uh, really well-working Telegram chat. Um, you are warmly invited to join this group. The link should be on the screen somewhere, either like it's also it's definitely on the website. Um, so you can ask questions questions and comments on the discussion. Um, we have reserved the last 10 minutes of this panel discussion for you. So um, Julian will zoom in and, uh, and uh, give the questions, is, is your voice, um, and is giving the questions so we can discuss and um, they can be answered. Um, I have the pleasure now to welcome and introduce the panelists who share this virtual podium with me. Um, first, I welcome Bogna Konyor. She's a writer and scholar and currently based in Shanghai. Hello, Bogna. Good to have you. A warm welcome also to Joanna Burke. She is historian and a public intellectual and physically located in Greece right now. Hello, Joanna. And last but not least, I have the pleasure to introduce Kerry Wolf. He's a writer, editor, and professor who's located in Houston, Texas. Good morning, Gary. <laughs> this panel not only connects four different time zones, but brings together three great thinkers for the purpose of discussing, discussing nothing less than the urgencies of our time with regard to the human non-human. I think we all agree on these urgencies, such as the climate crisis, growing economical difficulties, inequalities, the global pandemic we're in right now, rise of right-wing ideologies, and just to name a few. Um, so because of the urgency, I want to jump in with the first question for Joanna, which is um, the last, last night during the opening of the, of the festival, Peter Weibel said that we still have to become human. The ideas of the enlightenment regarding the human are not yet reached. Would you agree that we, I know we is an awful, unprecise term, but let's just work with it for now. Um, I'm not yet human. And what does it mean to become human then? Thanks. I'm really happy to be here. I think this is a really, this goes to really to the heart of what we're going to be debating in this, in this panel, and indeed the, the whole conference. This concept of the human is, of course, an extremely volatile one. I mean, whatever period of history you want to look at, whatever culture you look at, there are, of course, these commonsensical definitions of who is the human and what is the animal. Um, but what I find really interesting is that these are always being undermined. They're always contested. They're always being constructed and of course deconstructed. And I think it's not simply enough to say that there is this porous boundary between the human and the, the non-human or the animal, um, although of course there, there is. But I think more interesting is that the distinction is contested. The distinction is policed with this huge um, sort of precision. So in other words, the ideas, the values, the practices used to justify a particular understanding of the human over other forms of sentient life is what creates society and social life. And delimiting those territories um, not only involves violence, but inspires it. So this is always a becoming. And you know, if we look as far back as 1789, when the French Assembly's Declaration, the Rights of Man and Citizen, you know, the first line on um, the first, um, what do you call it, article in that states that a man is born free and remains free and equal. Okay, but of course, even then, it was absolutely not the case. I mean, that declaration excluded slaves, it excluded women, it exclu excluded Jews, it excluded actors because they pretended to be something else. Um, so I think that this, you know, this need to always be aware 
that the human is always a becoming, but also to kind of disrupt this human animal distinction. Um, becoming human is social labor and that labor is always political. Um, and that's, I think, what makes it so interesting for us to be discussing. Thank you. Um, but when we, when we speak of the human, non-human, that means that we have um, two very, uh, like one very small, let's say, and one very big category. So like the human and the non-human. So um, Carrie, uh, is the category non-human productive for addressing the urgencies we're facing right now or the category human? Oh, I think so. I mean, I, I agree with Joanna. I, my feeling's always been, and this is why I distinguish post-human from post-humanism as a philosophical orientation, because uh, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the aspirations of humanism are totally admirable uh, and need to maybe now more than ever be pursued in earnest. I mean, certainly I think that's what we've seen recently politically. Um, but, you know, my feeling has always been that we just need better philosophical tools <laughs> to try to think the aspirations of the Enlightenment and think the aspirations of humanism uh, than what we've inherited. And that shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, time moves on. We have, we have theoretical philosophical tools now that we didn't have 150, 250 years ago. So that project, I think Joanna's right, continues in earnest. Um, I think the virtue, one of the virtues of thinking about the non-human, <laughs> especially now, is I think something everyone feels at the moment, um, at least I do, is this paradoxical situation where the world has never been more interconnected and more fragmented at, at the same time. <laughs> uh, whether you think about ecology, whether you think about the phenomenon called globalization, whether you think about politics, whether you think about the increasing differentiation of human populations economically and, and in terms of precarity and exposure to climate change and so on. So I think, you know, the, to think about the non-human is to force you already to think about the paradoxical fact that, as my friend Donna Haraway puts it, not everything is connected, but everything is connected to something. <laughs> so, uh, and we see this, I mean, the perfect example, it's almost, it's almost too good to be true if you're a post-humanist to think about the COVID pandemic in these terms. I mean, it's a perfect example of how you can't even begin to think about phenomena like immunity and autoimmunity, um, for example, which are central to biopolitical thought and biopolitical philosophy as we know, without immediately beginning to think that paradox and to think in terms of complex systems. Um, so, for me, whether you're kind of interested in non-human creatures or not, whether you're interested in non-human life or not, one of the values of focusing our attention on the question of the human and or the non-human um, is that it, force, it, it, it forces us to sort of mobilize a new paradigm, I think, for um, thinking about not just transhumanism, not just post-humanism, but actually, as Joanna pointed out, the aspirations of humanism uh, itself and how we can continue to have a more sophisticated account of, of how those can be uh, uh, justified, grounded, whatever term you would like. Thank you. Um, when speaking of connectedness, so that means that we, we have to um, some sort of re-acknowledge that we are like connected not to everything, but always to something and how can we um, how can we, um, how can we, as we talked about it earlier, like how can we be sensitive to these dependencies again, let's say. Bogna, would you like to, add, to answer this question? Sure. I think there's two ways in which we can address this problem of going beyond the human or revising the human. And the first is very much like Jan and Kari are describing, which is a project of revision of the Enlightenment um, attempt of the Enlightenment project that's happening mainly in Western European and American intellectual scene. But maybe it's not that relevant when it comes to other intellectual histories. For example, I live in China. Here, the philosophical tradition is very much different. So the questions that were posed by the Enlightenment are not exactly that much present here as they are 
in the environments where intellectually this question of post-humanism is being brought up. So in this case, this is a project of Western enlightenment revising itself to be more ethical, more inclusive, in a way extending itself and its proposition um, somehow. On the other hand, there is the question of, you know, this connectedness that you speak of. There's something happening here that we might take as a matter of the evolution of humanity, the technological and biological evolution of humanity that is actually happening irregardless of our intention of it happening. Over the last hundred years, we have built almost by accident a network of planetary technologies that are changing our economies, changing our biology, changing our society to an extent we can barely grasp the speed of. And that evolution that our species is implicated in ecologically and technologically is connecting us irregardless of what politics and ethics we try to devise. So we have here kind of clashing but intersecting projects of trying to get our bearing in a very changed situation and always kind of lacking and trying to perpetually catch up to what we have started as a species, but what is spinning out of control at the same time. Do you think that um, we also have to develop a new form of ethics for this or abandon it all along? I think it's a difficult question. It is difficult to start questions about technological systems from the point of personal ethics and morality. They are very good for producing ideology. They are very good for politi politicians and priests to concern themselves with. But when it comes to species level thinking about complexity, I think we actually need to use non-human tools to think about non-human problems. So when we think about the development of machine learning or complex data processing systems that are able to think at a speed and scale beyond just human brains, perhaps we need to kind of implicate them in knowledge production process in order to grasp it. For an example, um, we can only know about climate change because we have very complex computer simulations of climate change. Otherwise, we would not have the knowledge of the ecological process that threatens our being as a species. We need computers to, to know about it and model it properly. Thank you. Um, I want to go back one more time to the, the, the notion of um, being connected um, and connectedness. Um, and um, I would like, let me check my questions. Um, yeah, I would like to um, ask Joanna, um, what you wrote um, just a, recently, a book about a human and, and animal relation concerning uh, love and um, using the concept of companion species of um, uh, the before mentioned Donna Haraway in um, your publication. Um, and do you see like the, to, to discuss these very specific relations human and animals have um, in the in the larger frame of like composing a new um let's say let's say demos or like let's say um a, a group that that needs to be um involved in in policy making decisions yeah i think um I, I think that that is absolutely the case. I mean, one of the things when you start looking at human animal relations is what you know, um, Carrie referred to earlier, and that is that the language in a sense is not adequate for the complexity of what we are, we're, we're trying to deal with here. And in order to create a politics of love, a politics of connectedness, a politics of affection, are trans species. Um, I think we need to actually change the languages that we use to talk about these things. And one of the things that I have found particularly helpful in doing this is actually the concept of the Mobius strip. And it's a very simple, uh, uh, um, 
concept. All you have to do is you just take a, a long uh, piece of paper, you uh, glue it together in at the glue the two ends together, you twist it 180 degrees. And what this does though, it creates a, a, um, a physical, a geographical even model whereby there is no inside outside, um, there is no hierarchies, there is no entrance point or exit point. And this gives us, I think, a way of talking about the differences within uh, between species without um, uh, creating hierarchies, without using very unhelpful dichotomies such as um, biolo biology in, inside, culture outside. And I think it's only by doing that that we can then think of, well, actually what we are doing when we're talking about interconnectedness is we're doing human political labor. That is, we are tying a knot in that Mobius strip and we are saying there is where the human starts and the animal ends. And of course that knot is like a slip knot, it moves around depending on culture, depending on um, historical um, factors and technologies and language and everything like that. And I think that by doing that, we can actually think more constructively about interconnectedness and the politics of interconnectedness. Carrie, do you want to add something to that or? Uh, yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. I, you know, the, in a way the whole, the whole project of biopolitical thought, I think has needed to be brought to that juncture. Um, in a way that the, phil the philosophical genealogy, the canonical philosophical genealogy of biopolitical thought has always been, it's kind of pretended to be interested in that question, but actually is not interested in non-human life in any serious way <laughs> until recently, I think. So I think that's, I think that is, this is one of those examples of how something that we used to think was merely an ethical issue, um, actually through the lens of biopolitics, we can see as a biopolitical issue. And it's of a piece. It's of a piece with how with how life, both human life and non-human life, are manipulated, um, explained, commodified, privatized, and so on, in ways that are distributed very unevenly across the planet, as we know. For which for which the species distinction, human and animal, I've argued, is actually not a constitutive distinction. You know, it's, it's kind of, that's kind of an old philosophical distinction that doesn't explain what's going on anymore. Um, I did want to go back to uh, Bogna's very interesting observation, which I think is right on. Um, and it points to, I think, two crises that I tried to address in my um, the video that I recorded for you guys um, before the conference. I think she's absolutely right that uh, non-human technologies, computer technology would be the paradigm, but there are many others we could point to you know, they're a part of our thinking at this point, whether we like it or not, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and so, but that, but that's created um, under this kind of acceleration we've experienced, you, that's created the paradigmatic situation that we face right now, I think at least in all the Western countries, but I would imagine it's true in China as well, which is the classic paradigm of kind of information overload. Right, in, in which we, there, we have so much computing power and we have so much data that it, we can know things and think things that we, that we couldn't know and think before, but it also creates a situation which a lot of um, sort of demagogues and ideological projects have taken advantage of um, to try to flatten what is in fact a very heterogeneous um, landscape of knowledge, in, in which I think disciplinarity actually then becomes more and more important. Uh, disciplinary protocols become more and more important in that kind of landscape. But the second thing I want to point to that I think is um, even more important that, that Bogner already gestured toward, you know, this, this creates, I think, a crisis for our political institutions. You know, these, these technological changes have so outrun um, the sort of philosophical foundations of our inherited political institutions, and they've outrun the evolutionary background of Homo sapiens as a species to really be able to live in that world, right? I mean, that's just, you know, I, I think Homo sapiens is still a pretty primitive species, <laughs> actually. So, you know, if you take that, if you take that asynchronicity 
with our political institutions and with our ability as a species to actually live in this, you know, this, this media scape in which time frames are shorter and shorter, screens are small, smaller and smaller, computing power is higher and higher. I think in a way that points to really one of the main crises of our, of our situation right now is, is kind of dealing with those two asynchronicities. Um, I'm glad Bogdan mentioned that. That's another way of, uh, another register in which to think about the, the term non-human outside of strictly biological or zoological register. I can comment on yeah. that, follow up on your question of interconnectedness and what Carrie just said. Um, we should not think in terms of ethical absolutes. So interconnectedness is not necessarily positive immediately as opposed to separatedness being yes. negative. In fact, interconnectedness is our whole problem, right? The fact that every human economic action reforms the geology of the planet, that's interconnectedness. At the same time, we have epistemological interconnectedness with information technologies that is a new condition of knowledge for us. I explain what I mean. In order, for example, to model climate change properly, we have to use very expensive, complex supercomputers that actually produce emissions in order to model climate change. They have to intervene into the biosphere in order to measure the biosphere. This is a completely new, non-empirical, kind of simulated interventionist type of knowledge. And I think for us, it means that the ideal of human agency that the enlightenment devised, right? An individual rational agent acting in the world, there's a causal relationship point A to B, is completely disrupted both by technological evolution and by ecological changes. It just says we can't think in terms of human agency very easily anymore. And this is exactly why the question of what should we do is not an interesting question to start from in those times because this do is very unclear when it comes to human agency with technologies and ecologies today. Thank you. Yeah, that was actually taking part of a question I had about this uh, notion of anthropocentrism, because um, that's that's the let's say the the first criticism, like um, opposed to uh, humans that we started like watching, scaling, measuring everything out of our own perspective, um, and with the notion of Anthropocene, which has also been like widely criticized as being making the, making the bad actor of the play in the title, let's say. Um, what sense does this make? Um, and so I wanted to ask you, um, how can we, with what is like this, thinking about this interconnectedness, as you said, um, Bogna, is this something that can get us out of this anthropocentric view or is like, trying to get out of this anthropocentric view already like an anthropocentric move? I don't think we have to try to get out of anthropocentrism because we are already radically displaced by the tools that we have created that have outgrown us. Like they arrived in our bodies as a xenomorph and like burst through our chest and are doing their own thing. Like the economy is almost starting to run on its own as an alien being that we are trying to grasp. So when we're thinking of, you know, how can we become like less anthropocentric? For me, that's an ironic question at this point where we are so radically displaced from our usual methods of knowing and being in the world. Maybe we just need to notice it more to actually desire being anthropocentric a bit more as a solution mm. that's up to everyone to decide um, how to react to this radical displacement. Mm. Do one of you, uh, Joanna and Carrie, want to react to that? I mean, I think this is one of the really interesting things that um, post-humanist thought has given us. Now, there is no such thing as post-humanist thought. There's a huge variety of 
these of, of this form of thought. But I mean, I think one thing is this: it has interge inter injected into our discussions notions of um, hybridity, um, interconnectedness, which is what we're all talking about, ideas that we are constituted through our relations with other sentient beings. Um, and the whole question of anthropocentrism, I think is a, in a sense, it's, a, it's an old question that is not, I think, as relevant to today's society as it was in the past. I mean, anthropocentrism is the one thing that has sort of dogged the, all the debates about human rights and animal rights, um, and in a way that I think has been very negative for non-human animals, just to, just to take one, one example, that it requires a sort of, um, a defining of the animal by a lack. Um, but I think that that kind of debate, we've, you know, we've been doing that debate for what, 40, 40 years. Um, and I actually agree that it is time to sort of move, move on from it. Good, thank you. Seems like we're agreeing on that one. <laughs> um, I have um, another topic, I kind of, maybe for the last three minutes we have, uh, well, two minutes we have is um, the one concerning um, categories. So let's say that we have the category of the human, the non-human. Um, are these um, categories or like the um, um, are these categories or classifications um, sometimes or like most of the time lead to simplifications and rational rationalizations? And I wanted to ask uh, you, Joanna, um, is is therefore like a categorization um, inherently violent and harmful or and do we need new categories or more fluent categories as maybe proposed by Donna Haraway? I mean, I think the fluidity of categories is, the, is, is really, really important. But also this whole idea of the crisis of categories that we keep hearing about, you know, I think this is just a fantastic thing because it's in the crisis of categories that we get creativity, we get er eroticism, we get um, revolutions, um, you know, whatever um, we can do. Um, that is going to, I think, improve our societies in whatever ways we want. It is, it does involve that kind of um, dismantling of the old categories that we've got. I'm throwing a bomb into that, the um, metaphorical bomb, I mean, <laughs> into those established ways of thinking. And all of us can do that. Um, you know, however we are situated, whether we are um, writers or housewives or scientists or mechanics or whatever, that we have this possibility to disrupt the categories of our own disciplines, of our own worlds. And that's where creativity lies. So you mean that with new categories, we can also open up like a new way of imagining, imagining things. Is that right? So mm -hmm. having a crisis of category also means having a crisis of imagination or like in the, being in the process of reformulating it. Yeah, and I think this notion of crisis, you know, turning this notion of crisis in general into something that is positive is especially it's a profoundly human activity. I mean, humanity was created when Eve went and plucked that apple from the tree of knowledge and um, disseminated it beautifully, um, uh, causing you know, uh, them to be humans to be cast out. You know, this is where you know, humanity is created in disobedience to the law, um, whether it's the law of, 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 of God or whether it's the law of institutions or capitalism or whatever, that is where humanity was born and where there is um, power, there's always going to be resistance. Um, and, and I think that is a real creative and something to be celebrated. Thank you very much. Um, we, have, we have now the time for questions from the Telegram chat. I will ask uh, Julian to jump in. Hi, everybody. I think you can already hear me. Yeah. If all is good, I think I will also be in the slide, but if not, then I can also continue from the off. Moritz, can I enter, enter the scene? Okay, let's just start like this and I will join you when I join you visually as well. And there was one question that came. Oh, that would help, wouldn't it? Okay, here we go. So there was one question that came up a few times, which was, um, related to this question or to this point that we need non-human tools to learn about non-human systems. And there was quite a few, 
bit of discussion around, um, you know, aren't all these alternatives that you outlined, especially artificial intelligence, aren't there um, human-made tools? And like, you know, what what is the worth of that distinction there? And what, where, what are you driving at? And I think um, related to that question, we can also package together with it, what other non-human tools might there be? Because several of you gestured, gestured to the existence of non-human tools, but there was interest in and hearing more about that. Oh yeah, um, I think I mean here non-human in a way that if you look at technology as a complex system, complexity simply means that the behaviors that emerge from the system um, are more than the sum of the behaviors that we put in. So there's an added emergent quality um, to any kind of complex technological system that was not pre-designed by the human creators. And we actually see that with the development of current prediction technologies, we see that we are heading towards having better prediction, but at a cost of understanding less as humans as to how predictions were exactly achieved. So this is called, you know, the black box of machine learning models. So what we are actually going to see in the future with knowledge production is that at the cost of getting better predictions from complex data analysis, we're going to lose the quality of being completely able to understand how that prediction was achieved. So when I use non-human here, I don't necessarily mean, you know, another species or a sentient machine, although I think that can also happen. I more gesture at non-humanist in how humanist models of knowing were presented before in intellectual paradigms. Yeah, can, can I just follow up on that? Um, you, this, this question has a long history for me, canonically, going back to the Macy conferences in the 1940s, first generation cybernetics, systems theory, then chaos theory, then complexity theory, theory around um, complex dynamics and emergence and so on. So that, that question has been a front burner question for a long time. I think what happened in the sciences um, that short circuited that genealogy and the name, one of the names for it is fascination with the genome as the book of life, was a kind of reductionist, um, an urge for reductionism in the science, in interdisciplinary sciences that, that not only found its way into biology in terms of, you know, the completely oversold bill of goods called the genome, but also with the pretension that um, complex systems were always already mathematizable and quantifiable and, and algorithmic. And I hope and think that we're at a point now in that conversation where we're beginning to see that that's not the case. I think this is what Wagner is gesturing toward. Um, you know, not, not that you get rid of mathematics and physics or anything like that. It's just we now kind of realize <laughs> how complex these systems are. So I. The fil to try to stitch this together with what Joanna was talking about earlier, where we started, it's always been the case that what I call my thoughts, what I call my emotions, what I call my intentions. I mean, the lesson of post-structuralist philosophy generally, not just Derrida, but everybody, uh, is that the conditions of possibility for any of those things are radically exterior to me and radically not human and radically not living. You know, the name for that in Derrida is iter iterability or difference, but all these philosophers have, have a name for it. So that's always been true. Uh, we've known that since Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche. The difference that Bogna is gesturing toward is not just an epistemological difference, it's a material difference, right? So and it's the acceleration of those material technological systems that has taken that epistemological truth and really radicalized it in terms of how it decenters the human. And I think that's a fundamental I think that's a fundamental challenge for our political institutions right now that, uh, and you see it with what's going on with social media, certainly in the United States, that I hope we can begin to address. I mean, we can also say, are humans the authors of technologies or are humans the vessels for yes. the evolution of technology? When you as a human mammal make a baby, like a human baby, you're not saying I'm the author of this. <laughs> right. like I made it completely on my own. You're the right. vessel through which life carries itself out. 
could right. it be the same with technologies that humans are the vessels for the development of some kind of technological complexity? Right. And at that point, as we were saying earlier, uh, Joanna, you started off by saying at that point, you need a different philosophical vocabulary to describe what's going on. I think there is another couple of questions which maybe fit here. There is like a question that basically goes into um, by Teresa, which basically asks, are we not, do we not um, have enough problems that are, are all too human, basically? Like, you know, are we ready for non-human interspecies collaboration when we are already, you know, struggling with incorporating our own kind? And I think related to that, um, you talk quite a bit about how institutions lag behind technological development. For me, these two questions relate in, in the sense of like, where, where do they bring us then in terms of directions? Um, we don't get to choose our own problems. Like the problems don't ask you, like, are you ready right now to have a global pandemic? Of course, no one is ever ready. Philosophy is the art of saying everything is obvious when it's already too late. Of course, we already know that. The question is, how do you deal with things in the moment? Um, we don't deserve or are ready for any problems that happen. So I don't think that's a correct way of phrasing the question, I guess. Just as a footnote to that, um, we don't have a choice. <laughs> um, you know, these things are all part of our lives anyway. Um, and, you know, we need to, we need to um, invent and reinvent and continually reinvent new ways and better ways of, of dealing with them. And we, we can't simply say it doesn't exist or that we don't have time right now to deal with it. Um, these are things that are central to, to living um, in, in today's world. Maybe still, I think the question um, remains like what kind of political institutions would we need to adopt to the recent technological developments? Several of you pointed out that we were sort of outrun by these developments as a species. And therefore, um, you know, talking about non-humans gives us a perspective on where we might go from there. And I guess there's been work on how to incorporate the non-human into the political. And there's a few questions which touch, touch on that. Well, I'll just start. I mean, the, the shortest way to um, address that in terms of political institutions is to, is to use the language and institutional structures that we have um, to broaden the sphere of inclusion in the demo. So the classic example is, you know, all of the movements you see in lots of different national uh, assemblies to extend the basic paradigm of human rights to at least some non-human creatures, uh, great apes typically, um, but doesn't need to stop there. And, you know, I, I would say that's fine as far as it goes. Uh, I'm all for it. I think great apes are people, non-homo sapiens people. I think there's plenty of scientific evidence for that. Let's move on and have a different conversation. That doesn't mean that the paradigm of rights, and, and Joanna was gesturing to this, and I bet in the background thinking about Hannah Arendt as she was, <laughs> that that, you know, that doesn't mean that the paradigm of rights that is kind of the coin of the realm in our current political institutions um, is the best way to think that problem. So, and this, I'm not, you know, just being sort of, you know, a sophist here. I mean, this involves really serious questions of, you know, philosophy of law. Is it, you know, what would legal structures look like if you evacuate categories like agency, intentionality, responsibility? Those are, those are complex questions in terms of how the law functions. So, and that may be one of the reasons that um, the default mode is always to go back to what we already do and what we already know. Um, but I think we're facing a situation now, and I do think I do think social media is putting a lot of pressure on this question, especially of of um, questions of regulation and questions of you know agency with regard to the dissemination of information in ways that are that are putting a lot of pressure on our existing paradigms. And I don't have a I don't have a, a brilliant answer to what those new structures would look like, but I think a lot of people feel that they need to change and evolve. I think with that call to change and evolve, we already have to draw to a close. <laughs> um, of course. <laughs> so 
I don't know if any of you will join the conversation on Telegram after the call. I think, Lena, you probably definitely will. And if any of you are available, that would be fantastic. Um, thank you, Joanna, Bogna, Kairi, and Lena for this rich discussion, <laughs> even though it was quite brief, of course. And um, Lena, I don't know if you have any closing words you want to give. Yeah, I also want to thank you. Thank you for the great question from the chat. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the audience, to the ZKM host, hosting this. And then, of course, thank you, Borgna and Carrie and Joanna, for engaging and forming this discussion with your thoughts and insights. Um, they were really, really interesting. And I think we have a lot to take from this discussion to the next panels. Um, big thank you to Teresa and Sarah, who I was uh, in, in constant communication with beforehand. And thank you, Clara, for supervising the kitchen state before we, we entered uh, in the discussion here. Um, and of course, the technical support team. Um, yeah, thank you. And I wish you a good afternoon in Germany and uh, night in Shanghai and day <laughs> in Houston. Um, and in Greece, um, thank you. Yeah, thanks for me too, for your more than human presence. And with that, we are almost at the end of the non-human session. If Moritz can make it happen, we will go right to the next program point, winding down with the film Nimia City, narrated by the artist and maker Jenna Sutela. And the work takes us right into what computer-mediated interspecies communication with bacteria and other beings might look like speaking to many of the questions that we started to talk about in this session. Can we go to the film? <laughs>